Hi, everybody, and welcome to A Gem of a Secret Podcast. My name's Donna. And my name is Coco Jim Holiday. How are you tonight, Coco? Um, I'm doing absolutely fantastic because we are filming another round of our live A Gem of a Secret Podcast live at the Queen's Head. Yes, with our special guest, Flawless, Flawless Shade. Shade. Flawless Dot Shade on Instagram. Flawless Dot Shade on Instagram. Yes. <laughs> You can talk now, Flawless. I know her. <laughs> <laughs> know her. Oh, gosh, that's great. We're so happy to have you here. And as I was saying before we got started recording, it's been a very long time since I've seen you. So I'm excited to catch up while we're recording mm-hmm. this conversation and see how you've been post Painted with Raven. Yes. I, I, first of all, thank you so much for uh, letting me be here on your first ever in-person podcast. Yeah. Second. 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 Oh my gosh, Second. I thought it was special. <laughs> <laughs> oh wait, before we get into questions, we need to do the thing that we forgot last time. So we're going to start off first off, Donna, what are you wearing this evening? Well, I'm going to describe what I'm wearing. Um, <laughs> it is this very nice little pink punk fantasy. I'm wearing a t-shirt dress and it has pockets. And that's exciting. We love a pocket. I have a mullet on, it's blonde, and I have some pink paint dripping down my forehead um i am wearing um actually i can describe what i'm wearing i'm wearing some black girl hair and then i'm wearing a fluffy dress i found on amazon it's where i don't have to wear a lot of body on but i feel really cute in this because i actually did the covid vaccine drive in this specific outfit so it has a lot of sentimental value flawless what are you wearing this evening i've waited so long for you to ask me that question (laughs) now what i'm wearing is really difficult to explain um, the top I got from H&M and the bottom I got from Forever 21. So that makes me basic. <laughs> I'm wearing basic. So uh, just a little tank and some short little seafoam blue shorts. <laughs> you see how my voice changed when you asked me? Okay, sorry. You're so I'm excited. nervous. <laughs> no, don't be nervous. Well, unlike Drag, drag Race, we do want to see some goddamn H&M up in here. So we're excited that you came in your H&M. Yeah, right. I left my rhinestones at home. What I am. <laughs> so, um, you are a Portland based drag artist who was on the first season of Painted with Raven, the first drag queen in Portland to be on a Wow Presents Plus show. Um, so, I think our fans want to know, I think people want to know about that first before we get into anything else. So, let's talk about Painted with Raven. Yeah. Um, let's get, I want, my first question for you is what was it like when you got. The quote-unquote qual, the call, whatever they call it. The call. Okay, I'm a little off balance because I haven't heard your intro song. Um, <laughs> but I will when I re listen to this back. Can't wait for Nick, or the episode to come out. Um, getting the call uh, was... So when I got the call, I knew it was them. Mm. If that makes sense. I don't know, I just got a feeling. I was actually at the Beaverton Transit Center. I was on the Max. And I was just about to hop on, actually hop on to get on the max. And so um, when they called me, I was like about to enter the tunnel going to the zoo. And they're like, well, you need to call us back, like call us back. Because they hadn't even told me yet. But I was like, I knew it. So I'm freaking out. So I get up at the next stop, which is Goose Hollow in Portland, if anyone knows Portland. Mm -hmm. And they're like, hey, they didn't, it's the first time me talking to them at all, talking to someone, everything else was like, like auditioning was super simple and easy and they're like you're on um the, my producer james and then i believe my producer sam uh had told me and it was just uh, you can hear from all the way back there it's so crazy um, <laughs> there's microphones everywhere sorry but yeah um yeah just I, I was crying the first thing i could uh remember thinking is i want to call my mom and i wanted to call my drag mother and that's who i call ended up calling First, allegedly off the record under the table. Wow. That's awesome. That's oh, yeah. really cool. Well, she didn't talk to anybody because she, you know, she kept the conversation. Yeah, yeah. She kept it completely to herself. Unless yeah. you go to my Wikipedia page where, <laughs> where people have edited that. So. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yeah, we are going to definitely talk about We will get into later. that. Yeah. <laughs> later in the episode. Because um, also, who is your drag mom? Kimber K. Shade, a.k.a. Henry Felton, a.k.a. Demand Drag Owner. Yes. yes, friend of the pod. Friend, we've we've friend of the, uh, friend of the pod. we've interviewed Kimber before, oh, yeah. way back in the day. Yeah, did a yeah. history episode. With I, Kimber. I do remember that episode. What two two thousand twenty? Yeah, before yeah. the before I, the pandemic. 
Yeah, it was actually it was before the pandemic. Actually, it was, was right it before? Oh, yeah. I'm a fan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, the funny thing is, uh, Demand Drag, just a small shout out for Kimber, is like really picking up traction and starting like yes. uh, drag dialogues and like mm. conversations about drag in the Portland area, which is actually really cool because it like lets us all be able to communicate in like a quote unquote safe space about drag. So it's nice. Yeah, and p- for people that don't know what the platform is for, it's a it's a way for people. It's a it's an area for people to be able to communicate for us performers. So let's say that you know not just for us to be able to promote our events and to gather performers that we want, but also um, for like lack of drama. Sometimes you know Portland had a big thing for the last two years of cancel culture and people calling out other people whether it was deserved or not. So it. Um, I know that Seattle was trying to book people um, oh, from Portland, and they saw how unprofessional that we were, and mm. so my mother created that forum for us to be able to talk about our issues in a safe space without being judged by other professionals. That's important. Wow, that's yeah. actually really cool. I didn't actually know the history behind Demand Drag, but you heard it here first, uh, listeners. So, back to you and uh, the Painted with Raven season one. Um, so if everybody watch it. Well, there's going to be a little bit of spoilers in here, so this little bit of a spoiler warning. Um, you did pretty well. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, he did pretty well on the show. Did you vote for me? I did. Thank you. I did. I was I was super encouraging of it. Um, there, there was no voting, by the way. Yes, I did. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> there was there was posting to your story and being like, "Hey, one of our own is in the in the." end of it i don't want to like spoil anything like i'm trying not to but uh, i mean it's been like i guess it's been a, it's yeah it's been like six months right? that's true so, check it out yeah. check it out flawless was a finalist okay <laughs> yeah so what uh, so what was the audience uh not the audience what was your community reaction like to you being on the show um hmm i want to choose my words carefully you know i get really honest i think it was <laughs> it was supportive we'll focus yeah I, it was nice to be able to f- get some recognition from people that um, have supported me for, for a while, that have come to all of my drag shows, bingos, trivia, so it was really nice to get that support. Um, and then, you know, my friends and family, like Blood Family, that's, I think, where I was probably most shocked about the support that I got from them, so. Yeah. That's really cool. Um, what would you say is the biggest learning lesson you did from the whole experience? There's like a few or, hmm, learning lesson. I guess I would say I think I was really myself and I, I think I gave everything that I could give in terms of like for production. Mm-hmm. So it allowed, I, I, I wouldn't be so honest, I think next time if I were to do it again, I wouldn't be as combative, as honest, as annoying underdog you know there was there's a lot of times where I was insecure and in those confessionals I you know I I really kind of just was honest about everything about like you know projecting my feelings and insecurities and um the the fans definitely told me about it (laughs) and what they didn't like about it (laughs) well that's one of the things with reality tv is like we see nowadays on a lot of these shows people come in very produced Mm. and they have kind of like that knowledge of like okay i'm gonna watch exactly how i am and it kind of lacks authenticity in that way i will let me stand up and say that everything that i said was Mm -hmm. said and yeah it it was there was some there was some there was i I could have been made i could have felt less confidence let's say like more Mm. more less more less confident i could have been more (laughs) or less i see what you're saying i could have been been even less confident confident than I than I was after it ended just based on the reaction from some of the from the fans but I will say production mm-hmm. did a great job and they didn't edit me a specific way that my actions were everything were all real awesome. <laughs> so let's talk about the fan reaction yeah absolutely um actually yeah let's just talk about the f- so outside of just like Portland fans like let's talk about how you responded to fans and like what they said and like positives and negatives and things like that and what was that like being on a platform where you had people to basically critique you in any way shape or form behind a keyboard positive Um, negative i think uh it was i think we wait for that moment and we wonder how it's going to be and we kind of like i don't care i don't care what happens or if it's negative or positive 
I just want the platform to make money or to be able to change my lifestyle or to be able to tell my haters I told you so. Um, and, but it also, like, there was that, but it also was like, okay, now what? Mm. I don't know. Um, I also just lost my train of thought, too. Can you repeat the question? Oh, yeah. Fan, <laughs> yeah, I'm so reaction. nervous. Why am I nervous? I, that's <laughs> terrible. Uh, We're all friends here. We're all friends. It's all safe spaces. (laughs) No, what was the fan reactions, positive and negative? Like, when you're reading those comments, even the ones that are just like, like, I even talk about the comments, like, that are overwhelming, that are like, I love you. Oh, my gosh, you're my Mm -hmm. favorite person or something like that. Like, from complete strangers on the internet. Um, To the comments are like, oh, my gosh, I wish you'd go home or something like, or wish you'd get muted this week. So... Explain a little bit about your fan reaction and then and how you took comments. And yeah, how did, it, how did that affect you? The reaction was weird. I, yeah, like I was saying earlier, it, it was, it's hard to anticipate what people are going to think of you, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, the, we'll start with the positives. The positives were amazing. Every episode, or every episode I talked about my black experience, whether they put mm-hmm. it in or not, and I, I don't remember how much they put in about it, but every episode I made it apparent that um, I really wanted to talk about my experience being black and to hopefully inspire other brown kids, black kids, queer kids in my, you know, that may look up to makeup or people like me um, in a positive light. So I I got some reactions like that where it was, they're like, it's nice to see you, you're black, confident, da da da. And then we'll say the negative outweighed the positive. Or maybe, maybe more so because I focused on that and it impacted me the most but I got some death threats I got people telling me that I'm delusional that I need to kill myself because I thought I was the underdog that I was you know insecure um, during my season but I will say I made it to the finale and um, they're probably not even a makeup artist or a drag queen and if they are they didn't get it on did that surprise you the passion behind some people's comments over a, a TV show it surprised me, and it also didn't. I, I was kind of. I knew that. I knew that I was going to be the most opinionated during of the season. So I was like, "There's going to be reaction." I just you don't you can't plan for when it does happen or your feelings for it. So I, I guess. I guess it was definitely challenging. Of like, I definitely got into like a depressive mode. Like I haven't mm. posted on Instagram, and I posted my first picture and three months because I just didn't want people in my, in my, like, you know, inbox telling me just horrible things or whatever, but um, I'm a little bit more confident now. After DragCon, it helps. For For sure. sure. Oh, wow. I didn't even, yeah, I guess that could have definitely happened. On my season, I was, like, the one who stayed a little bit too long because I was in the bottom three times on my season, and um, people didn't love that because they saw their favorites go home, and I have to. I have to honestly admit, like, so Claire apparently, who works as the event manager of the place that we're in, I was at her event on the episode she went home and I stayed. Let me tell you, that is awkward, especially when you didn't have a lot of friends in the community because I had just moved here, and everybody like the room was silent. Yeah, and I was just like, oh gosh, this is so uncomfortable. <laughs> like, so I totally get it because like that's what it feels like actually on the internet too. Like people. They feel like they can say whatever... We all know this. They can say whatever they want because they can't actually get to us. And we don't even read all the comments, but every once in a while, a comment will get through that we do read positively and negatively. That's, I think that's probably what surprised me the most was reading... I tried not to read, but you see, but you search for, you, you search for it almost. You, you're searching for the mm-hmm. negative comments. You're searching for the positive ones. And um, yeah, you can read... 10 positive comments with that one negative one that gets it gets to you so it it, it it i think what shocked what really shocked me the most was people that went out of their way there was a school teacher that messaged me and i there's like four people that i like i looked them up and saw where they worked and i messed and i went to and reviewed their high school and I said, and I screenshotted the things that they were saying to me. And I was like, I hope that this isn't how this teacher is treating their students at your school. And he apologized to me. And I, I didn't delete my comment or anything. So I don't know. I ho- hopefully everything is okay with him and he learned. But I'm like, first of all, it's just a TV show. Um, it's not that big of a deal. It's, a, it's not even Drag Race. So it's like, it's a, it, you know, I'm like, it's only, there's $25,000 online. It's the first season. It's not that big a deal. It's just, yeah. we're, we're supposed to have fun. It's makeup. Um, yeah, and it was something to 
help people be less sad during COVID. The people on the show and the people mm-hmm. off the show watching it. Because we did. We watched it every week at, yeah. at my oh, yeah. house. Like, we had, always had a bunch of people over. And we purposely didn't invite <laughs> Flawless because I know she's insecure. And, like, she... <laughs> Because, like, being in the front of, like, watching this TV show that you're on, I remember it was really hard to watch it with other people. Because I didn't know how it would be edited. I watched it by myself for the, except yeah. for excluding the first episode and the last episode. And I'm, I'm almost, I'm glad that I did because the first half of the season I was just annoyed with myself. Even though I was winning. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then the second, I, it just was, I, I'm glad that I didn't have that pressure. Um, I couldn't imagine because... Yeah, I could imagine being a Rue girl and just watching yourself with hundreds of people in, in a room. That just super uncomfortable. I remember, yeah. I think it was, I think it was Thorgy Thor, who said that because I think the episode she went home in was like not like an episode people thought she was going to go home, mm-hmm. and she was sitting at her home bar and she was just like <laughs> watching it, right? Because remember, this is like a year, you know, ago that they filmed the mm-hmm. thing back in the day. Now it's like four months, but anyway. Like, so she said she was just sitting there, and people just, like, came up to her, they're like, oh my god, girl, how do you feel? And she's like, I've processed my emotions about this. Like, I know it's new for everybody, but I've already processed my emotions. And so, like, I do was get that, that. Was that All-Stars, or was that the regular season? Regular season. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So she didn't know what to expect, too. Yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. So, I, yeah, I kind of get it. And I, I want to know, because I, I didn't get to... So, just a small note. Um, actually, no, we'll get to that question later. I want to know right now... Would you be on an all-star season? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yes, um, yes, I want the money, and yes, I want the notoriety. I, 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 would, I, I, I made it very clear to Raven, too. I think on the very last episode, that ends with me saying, and you, I want to be on season two or all-stars. Because like, I, you know, as much, I, I want to be part of the World of Wonder, you know. Family. Like, family, and... Mm-hmm. and and I, I'm broke. I didn't win that $25,000, so I, I'm trying to get out here, trying to network. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it makes a lot of sense, Yeah, honestly. So uh, what I was going to get to is you had a viewing party for the finale that was uh, produced by, I think, Demand Drag or the Beauty Boys. It was by Both. the Beauty Boys. Beauty Boys and Demand Drag. That was at uh, CC Slaughter's, and you brought out Jaman mm-hmm. uh, from the series as well. So tell us about the finale day, getting ready, and, like, kind of your reactions to everything at CC Slaughter's, and the community reaction, because it was really positive. And uh, Jordan was also there. I just want to give a shout-out to Jordan. Oh, my gosh. We, we <laughs> who we interviewed on the podcast. We did interview Jordan. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I listened to that one, too. He was a lot better spoken than I am now. Oh, wow. <laughs> You're doing great. I'm all stuttering and nervous. Um, so, finale day. We'll call it. Well, the the preparation for it, you know, because again, I'm broke, so I don't have the the season, the RuPaul season finale budget like some of the other Ru girls do. Maybe I need to stop comparing myself. I'm still projecting. Um, so I had an old outfit that I used that I just recycled it and added on some new rhinestones and spent a lot of time that week rhinestoning. Probably, I think I spent like 16 hours rhinestoning that outfit. And the, and the wig, I had a custom rhinestone wig that I did myself. Um, so I sat down and watched the finale that day um, because the f- it was a Friday and that's when, that's when it aired. Yes. Um, so I watched it that day to, you know, figure out everything. And I totally forgot how much they made us do that season finale episode. I, they made us do so much. I remember it being the longest day and my face hurt. Um, <laughs> you, didn't, you didn't ask that question. Okay. Um, and then... So I, yeah, it was it was just weird to to rewatch that moment again and to be like, hopefully, I was like, did I smile? Hopefully, I didn't sulk too much when I found out that I didn't win. And I like, because we knew we knew I had already known that I lost, so I didn't find I didn't find out that day. Oh right. Like they didn't do it like RuPaul's Drag Race where mm-hmm. they hear different your reaction. Alternate. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, that was hard to relive that mm-hmm. a little bit. But then I was just like, let's have fun now. Like now it's about me, Javon, Jordan, and Portland. And like my goal was to really put Portland on, on the map to for hopefully give other entertainers or artists the opportunity that I have or future or better opportunities. Um, hopefully I helped with that. So that was that goal. Um, the show itself went really well. Um, I really want to thank the Beauty Boys and Demand Drag for helping sponsor that uh, event, or not for not helping sponsor that event, for sponsoring that event. 
um, and being able to, uh, they, they are the ones that reached out to CC Slaughters that uh, allowed us for a safe space. And he shout out to um, the Eagle, who also had offered a viewing party, uh, oh, several viewing awesome. parties. So mm. thank you to, to those people. Oh, God, I love the Eagle. I love Dan. I love the Eagle. It's such a good place. And that's actually awesome that they actually reached out for community support. A lot of us um, entertainers in the city were talking about you being on the show and what that means for Portland as a whole, kind of like at the time of filming this, like Jinx Monsoon is currently, uh, she did rep Portland um, on her, the all winter seasons of All Stars and currently. Did she? she? Yeah, she did. Okay, I, didn't, I haven't seen Portland. I think there was a Q&A thing that she did outside of the season where she mentioned buying a house here and kind of yeah. being, coming back to Portland. Okay. So. Yeah, and, um, and I know that Jinx actually frequents this place that we're currently in. And the Queen's Head. <laughs> and it was just, it's really cool to see Portland getting this notoriety. Like, currently, like, you know, we had Flawless on Painted with Raven. Mm-hmm. We have House of Ada doing Legendary. Jinx Monsoon is, cr- like, for Jayla. clear icons. Yeah, Jayla. Jayla mm-hmm. being on Lizzo's, uh, oh, what is the full title? Something with the big girls. Big girls, yeah. 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 Um, and, like, so just having that representation. Kaina Martinez, I mm-hmm. want to say. Oh, yeah, Kaina Martinez. Kaina Martinez is also on a show right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's on, currently on YouTube, but I bet mm-hmm. it will blow up one day. So a lot of queer people in the last... This is all in the last year, yeah. keep in mind, yeah. that all these people are on these shows, like, putting Portland on the map and just, like, doing the thing. And everybody, for the most part, is doing well on the shows that they're on. Yeah. So just a huge thing, just in general. Um, before we get into our next topic just because we need to take a brief break. Donna, how are you doing this evening? I will let you know after this brief commercial break. Hey, are you kind of sick and tired of going downtown to watch quality drag shows? We're bringing you a specialty drag show to your neighborhood bar at the Montevilla Saloon. It is every last Sunday of the month at 7 o'clock p.m. So you can see downtown drag just in your backyard. Located at 8012 Northeast Gleason Street. Once again, that's 8012 Northeast Gleason Street. Be on the lookout for more information. It's a podcast with Coco and Donna Tell a podcast. Tune into what they tell you podcast. With Coco and Donna Tell a podcast. Well, Coco, I am feeling flawless. Because so we have flawless with us today. <laughs> just being around, before. just being around her, I just feel flawless and happy. Because it's been a very long time, honestly, since I've seen you. I am really taking a break from the scene, and I don't go out to places where there's alcohol served. Um, so I just want to say, as someone who's known you for the last few years, that I am. Um, very proud of you for representing this place in the way that you did and um it was really cool to see a display of your art um and have that live forever on a platform like that and um i'm just really happy that you're here and it's good to catch up with you it's good it's really good to see you i haven't seen you in in years i actually since your house yeah um (laughs) Two years yeah. ago, because we were in we were in each other's pods. Yeah, yeah, we were in pods. So, yep. but um, thank you so much for inviting me, both of you. Um, both you both look amazing. Kitty right. Carrie all just walked in, looking gorgeous and with some yeah. big we hair. We love Kitty. Hi, Kitty. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so I I told this I said that, I think I said this online once. Flawless is one of the people I actually talk to most often. I don't see most often, but I talk to most often. Like, because Flawless, I go to Flawless for all my drama, my issues, my my successes, my failures, and whatever. And then just having somebody just to talk to about issues that we go through through life. So, it's funny being on this podcast because, like, I know a lot about what's going on with Flawless. So, a lot of the questions I have are things that I just don't know about because we weren't friends at the time or we didn't meet each other yet. So, one of your claim to fame, claims to fame here is, like, that long recurring show that you had called Pre-Pump. And how did that actually start? I want to know that. I don't know that story. Um, Pre-Pump started when uh, Ember's Avenue ended. Uh, so I was on... I, I first got my drag career started at the Ember's performing um, as a guest. And then I got had my own 
then I was on cast and then I quit Embers because they're only paying $15 for five songs. Um, I know. That, wow. I know. But at least they were paying. I would. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So when Embers ended, I uh, walked to CC's and I was like, just through passing, walked to management and I was like, hey, if you're ever trying to do like a drag show here, like hit me up, you know? Um, and they're like, actually, yeah, we, we would love to start one. We should, let's set up a meeting. It was like right there on the spot too. Um, and I was living with an anonymous at the time, or we were living together and Inanna had also approached them about doing a show as well and said, Oh, flawless would I think, or flawless is down too. She was speaking up for me. Um, so I originally was supposed to have my own show at CC's until they were like, oh, we, I, we would actually love to have you and Inanna because we think the dynamic would work better, especially like you need a, you at that venue, you need a co, co-host. Yeah. I, don't, I couldn't do a one woman show there. I wouldn't want to. It would be too stressful. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, we, we started that way. We, um, yeah, I'll, I'll stop there before I get and dig myself a hole because the community knows. <laughs> the community knows all the tea. I do. We'll, we'll just say that if it wasn't for pre-pump, I I won't say if it, it, I don't think that a lot of the drag entertainers would be paid what they're being paid now. We're not the only, I think we, I, we kind of helped start that. I think I, you did. I, um, we won't say we, I'll say me. I think that a lot of people in this community actually know that. Yes. Even people who like are not like, don't like not me. super fans of you is the word I was going to use, but people who don't like you actually attribute how much people are making now to you. Yes. Um, because when you started your show at Legacy at, Legacy at uh, Henry's Tavern, RIP, not for the show because the, the whole venue closed, um, you were paying girls well. Like, yeah, really you set well. a precedent that not really any other place had set. Was that was it two hundred dollars for guests, or was it one fifty? One seventy five. One seventy five. I okay. think. Yeah. Yeah. I want so, to put that out there. So for yes, it was a solid yeah. booking and. Yeah, I think you deserve that credit so much, and I don't think you get recognized for it enough. I, I, there are a lot of people who have really changed the way that entertainers, and especially drag entertainers here, are compensated, and you are, I want to say, one of the pioneers for making sure that everybody was getting that. Because it's easy. The thing is, it's easy to be an entertainer and get your piece and keep your piece, mm-hmm. you know? But to really go out there and advocate for your fellow entertainers, it's not something that a lot of queens do. So, it, I mean, outside of Portland, yeah, <laughs> that's, yes. that's yeah. What I yeah. I find I found it. There was a queen. People, I've told the story several, several times. So there was a queen that said, "I will never." Oh, it's from outside. Okay, okay. Um, <laughs> we'll just <laughs> sounds like rain. This, we'll edit, we'll this, edit little, this out. We'll edit that piece out. I forgot what I was saying. <laughs> Um, outside of Portland, you were saying there was um, a queen talking about... Oh, uh, yeah. so I decided to start standing up for the drag entertainers in Portland to start getting paid when a queen walked up to me and said that they had heard a very well-known queen talk about our show and called it Free Pump. And I said, I never mm-hmm. want someone to ever think, like, when I make it, if I, when I make it big, I'm successful. I never want people to say that I used the people that I hired to get to where, you know, I use them for free, their work for free. I'm like, I never want that to be told to me again. It's one of my, it, it's like, it's a huge insecurity for me. I just don't want people to feel like I used them ever or I didn't stick up for them. And then, so I decided that that's why I left pre pump. They weren't paying, they didn't, want, they didn't want to pay at the time or couldn't pay at the time. And I said, I don't want to be rem- remembered for that. I'm going to find someplace, someplace else. And then, you know, they just started a new Friday night show that had their year anniversary show and that they're paying their guest performers $100 mm-hmm. plus where they weren't before. And, um, and I'm, that's, you know, I'm happy for that. That's the change that we need to see. Yeah. yeah. Other bars, other than CCs, weren't paying their queens either. They messed up, but they're not messing up anymore. So that's how change happens. Yeah, yeah. I agree with that. I fully agree with that. And I think that... Um, one of those things about that, we talk about paying drag artists a lot on this podcast and like how to make it as a full-time drag artist in this community, which can be really difficult because there's a lot of shows that don't really pay a high enough booking fee um, and what that picture looks like. And we understand that not everybody can pay that high booking fee or whatever, but trying to be a full-time drag artist in this city is hard when if you go to Seattle or Chicago or 
tons of places in California, you could be a full-time drag artist because of the base minimum fees are like pretty high and there's not a lot of free shows left and right. So it's just, you really did start something that was special. I, I think that, because I, I, I want to say, I want to preface that, yeah, other cities outside of Portland do pay, but they also are... They're, they also are bigger and they have more competition with themselves mm -hmm. too. Also inspiring other artists to work harder to get those spots that are paid. So it, it's, you know, there's pros and cons of, of that. If we weren't paying people here in, uh, in Portland, um, then you would see the quality, you would see a quality level go down and it would be more charity based, which is not bad at all. Right. Um, but what I do is, is business. For sure, there's money. There's there is money involved. As much as I would love, you know, to give my time for free and to be, be able to have that privilege, that it is important to pay your talent because um, we're not just objects. We're actually trying to benefit, bring people, bring our followers into a business. Sometimes the majority of followers will have triple the amount, or the amount the f performers will have triple the amount of followers that a business does on their social media. And social media is a huge part of media and marketing. Definitely. Yeah, it is. So, um, also, I wanted to know how, who came up with the name Prepo, <laughs> or how did CC Slaughters that? did? They did. Yeah, oh, we, didn't, we didn't choose the name. Interesting. I've always wanted to know that. But they wanted it to like pump up your night. They really wanted like the, the dance party after um, when CC Slaughters. They really wanted um, a drag show on Friday because no one was coming on Friday nights, or there was there wasn't the amount of people that that there is now. Yeah. Um, and so they really wanted us to pump up the night to prep people up for the dance party like, ah. after that's why it was an earlier show and why Bolivia you know now let's dance like we had yeah. that transition from show to oh, dance party oh I remember that Me I too. remember that oh gosh yeah Bolivia coming out like at the end of the show and just like you know yelling like all right hit the showers <laughs> hit the showers line yeah yep. remember that yep. Michaels 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 <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness so um, let's get a little bit more into you and your drag career. Um, what made you actually ever want to start doing drag? I was using meth at the time, and the people that I was hanging out with, uh, it is who you hang out with, um, we, I, I kind of was like, we should all dress up as like the Spice Girls for Halloween. Mm -hmm. And like they all said yes, and I was like, okay. Like, you know, I was like, let's go. And I said that that's when Flawless had uh, the song Flawless by Nicki Minaj had mm -hmm. come out. And the remix by Beyonce when Beyonce was on the Carter tour had mm -hmm. just ended at the very, uh, in Paris, uh, Nicki Minaj came out with Beyonce. And Nicki Minaj walks out. And I, in that moment was like, I'm going to be, if this was a music video, I want to be what the music video would have been. I was feeling my oats. I was, so I knew my name from the moment I decided to try on drag for my first time. That's really cool. Wow. I actually, I tell I, people, I also haven't done meth in seven plus years and haven't yeah. realized, so I just want to preface for that. <laughs> yeah, actually, that's, I think, one of the first things that you and I bonded over, because I have definitely, like, sobriety has not been a linear journey for me. It's mm -hmm. been something that's, like, definitely had its, like, waves of, you know, clarity and then also, like, really big downturns. So, um, what... I guess has that been like for you um being off that and um being in the state that you are now um first of all i want to say clarity would be a great show name for your next oh endeavor. Yeah. yeah i'm not yeah. normally i take a five percent for a name but okay i'll, I'll do that yes. for donation <laughs> That's giving back. i love that <laughs> <laughs> i'm sorry ask your question over time sorry so i guess what is what has it been like um being where you are now, mm. kind of looking back at all that, and um, what advice do you have for people who are really trying to get good and 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 uh, maybe have been in those scenes and are kind of looking for a way to um, to get out of that? I um, my experience with I'm not I'm not sober. I'm I am specifically sober, or I'm I have specifically not done meth for the time since I stopped. So I want to make sure that I say that I 
do other substances as well. I don't allow those other substances to take over my lifestyle yeah. um, or, you know, affect the people around me and myself. Um, but I will say that, like, the reason why I'm so, like, I, I take myself very seriously, especially as, like, a, a drag entertainer is because... I was like, I was almost homeless. I was one week away from being homeless where it was like, if it wasn't for drag, if I wasn't getting ready in a, at some random person's house that was providing free drugs for these boys, these, not boys, sorry. Let me say legal cis men um, mm. of age. Um, if I wasn't like, I had to come to myself moment in a mirror where I'm getting ready in, in a mirror with my makeup at some random dude's house and it was like you're an addict and i feel like it was like my spirit guides kind of being like that you're an addict and if you don't change your life now then you're 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 going to be on the streets mm -hmm. um that's when i that night i decided to go to my first ever na meeting and it, that night i spoke at my uh, at the meeting and it was the first time i ever called myself out loud an addict mm. and being able to just be able to be in a room with other people that under that where we all had the same struggle but different mini struggles from that or not mini struggles but just that kind of branched off of that that was like empowering to me mm -hmm. and so i did those i did those meetings for 30 days and then i decided that makeup was my form of therapy and i didn't want to be a different version of taj before or i, I want i didn't want to be a different version of taj like i i just wanted to not do meth yeah <laughs> you know so i was like i i didn't want to like stop smoking weed or stop drinking because I didn't have I didn't feel like I had that problem I just was like the problem in my life that ruined that ruined my lifestyle was the meth for me so mm -hmm. my advice is to do what um is to first of all seek help I yeah. got I got my my dad called me out and you know they, they saw the signs and he called me out and I I didn't lie I said yes and five days later that's that, that was when I had that mere moment yeah um so I would say be honest with yourself if you can and um, like seek help. Yeah. Definitely seek help. You don't have to do it by yourself, but ultimately in the end, it is you alone that has to get through it. There are resources out there. Absolutely. That's mm -hmm. a really amazing thing and awesome for you to be able to share with and all it, of our it, It's also constant. I, I, I have dreams that I do it all the time that, you, you know, it, like, it is constant recovery, mm -hmm. um, that it doesn't just end. So that's why I really want to say that, like, I'm not, like, I'm not in meetings or I, you know, I, 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 my form of therapy for my meth issue is makeup. Wow. I, you know, I think sobriety or even just abstaining from substances, I, I think the journey is different for everyone. And um, in our culture, we try to box it in and think that there is only one way to do mm -hmm. things. Um, at least that's how it makes us feel, you know, like with me being an alcoholic, um, AA is the most popular form of getting help. And it doesn't work for me because I have a certain amount of religious trauma that just kind of, it, it doesn't mm -hmm. feel helpful for me. So there are other ways that I have to um, find that peace and find my ways of coping. And um, I think it's great that you're on here and talking about your experience because people need to know that, yes, you don't have to abstain from everything, but if something is impeding your life and it's really causing you a lot of issues and a lot of problems, then it's something that you can get help for. Absolutely. And there's a, yeah. there's a path out of that. There's, there's, there's for, I, for me, it's like, it, like when I say it's like, it's, it really does come down to you because you're the one putting in the action, but it yes. doesn't mean that there's the, there's only one right way of doing it. Yes. You know, there's only one path mm -hmm. that you could, there's, first of all, there's several paths and there's sometimes there's paths on those paths too yeah. that branch and intersect oh, yeah. with each other. So there's no one right way of doing it. And that's why we say, so NA meetings or AA meetings, that doesn't mean that it may not work for you. It may work for you too. Yeah. Yeah, right. I like that you said there's paths on the paths because like I, I feel like tea. every day I'm finding out another way to mm -hmm. like deal with it and another way to just like heal, you know? Yeah, it's, what, is, what is meant to be is meant to be. Yeah. And then finding, here's the thing about the support system too. I found that the one thing that I do think is a little bit universal is finding that support system for whatever it looks like, mm -hmm. whether if it's from the NA meetings or the AA meetings or a great group of friends or you know, having a 
therapy session talking about makeup when you're talking about your days. Like, I, I think that that people need people, I think, is a, like a meaning of life in certain capacities. Like, even if you have a, per, a person who has no friends, but then finds a community that can help them through the things that they're going through, even just by their existence, I think that's really mm-hmm. important. Mm-hmm. Like, it's really true. I agree. And yeah. so, this, this is what's weird, too. Like, you have been on this, you've been on a trajectory that I think is so fascinating for other people and we can edit out parts that I because I have some questions for you too so because from what I remember you you are adopted right is that true or I, not true I am not adopted I I have a my, my stepmom I have a stepmom who oh, okay. is I don't call her my stepmom she's my mom but mm-hmm. um, my birth mom uh, left me at a daycare uh, for like two weeks abandoned me for uh, yeah she abandoned me when I was two years old and then wow. so my dad raised me and my stepmom raised me and they have been together for like 27 years I believe I have very young parents and so um yeah my my stepmom is just my mom and so fr- her yeah. family took me in too so I have my my mom, stepmom was white um I have this whole Italian family that took me in as theirs and being you know a black little boy it was you know that's that's like everything it's just it's not blood it's people that that spent time you know and so i i did my my birth mom has reached out to me uh a few different times i've met brother and my brothers and sisters i never knew i had um and yeah i'm like i i kind of just i don't really have a relationship with my birth mom but Mm -hmm. i kind of just would prefer to focus on the my the family that is there that has spent time on me that doesn't want to just hop in and out of my life that's yeah how have you how have you managed to deal with so as an adult like as we're all adults now how do you feel like those experiences may have shaped the person you are today mm-hmm. do you feel like that struggle that you went through with your birth mom has made you like you think it was like a better experience like where you are now is because you had to deal with that or do you think you did it in spite of that it's like nature nature's nature versus nature yes. um I'm de- I mean, I definitely would be different if I wasn't, yeah. if I wasn't raised with my birth mom too. I, I always like, as a kid, I always wondered, um, because I knew my stepmom was my stepmom because just, I just knew my, my <laughs> I just knew, you know, yeah. um, I think I remember my dad, my dad told me that my, my mom wasn't my mom, my birth mom when I was in the fourth grade. It was like, it was a week after nine eleven. I remember that, mm-hmm. and he just let me know, boom. Um, and so, damn, I forgot the question again. Uh, do you feel like the person you are today? Is- oh yes, nature versus nature. Um, my life would have been fully different. Mm-hmm. It really would have. I, I'm, I'm really happy that I had my dad in my life because I don't think I would be where I am today. I think it, it, I would have been kind of more of a, a stereotype and a percentage a statistic um my you know not to shame like this sex ugh, the sex worker industry or anything like that mm-hmm. but i know my mom like my birth mom is still like using that as a, like a source of income and everything i just know that that path wouldn't have been right for me my dad said that the man that she was dating that is my brother's dad um was pinching me like i would i like i would come to him with scars on my body Oh, and like I didn't I wasn't like I didn't drink milk I was like she only gave me like iced tea like very like that type of stuff so I just feel like I I I don't know I just like jail or gang can you like right I don't know yeah <laughs> I, I, I absolutely I sorry I, I'm, I'm smacking my legs so sorry about oh, no, that you're good. no don't worry I about actually it. you brought up a point that um it's funny I didn't even think about circling back to this and it kind of even applies so Don and I do this frequently on this podcast and you've been doing it too and I think it's really important that we have this conversation now that you correct yourself a lot because you live in Portland and I know it's because you live in Portland and we're not going to mince words about the fact it's because you live in Portland but let's talk about an uns- more of a not get cancelled side so why do you think it's important to consistently try to live up to the expectation that Portland puts on anybody with a voice um, because, well, Portland has an issue with performativeness, um, 
we could really dive into that. So it is, it's very, keep, I find, even right now I'm, <laughs> I'm catching myself because, you know, the majority is white, non-black, non-POC. We're going to wait for the sirens to go by. <laughs> I love how like the like we talked about blackness for five seconds and then, like, the cops are just like pulling up. <laughs> for real. Like they were like, oh, this is too triggering right now. <laughs> Can you say the question again? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, we might leave those sirens in there because that's really funny. Like so, you know, me and Donna tend to catch ourselves a lot on this podcast to make sure that we're saying things in a really PC manner because of cancel culture and then partially because we live in Portland. We know, I know that you do it a lot as well. We've noticed it. You've done it a, a few times in this podcast. Um, why do you feel like you have to live up to that expectation or why do you consistently try to work, live up to that expectation? Um, I think that my feeling and belief is that non-black people and non-POC people in Portland want to look for things to say that you're wrong about. I think that... Um, of the majority of the non disenfranchised community here in Portland um, wants to be a part of something depressive, if you will. They want to. I, I, they want to be part of like a minority, so they can kind of share their feelings. That oh, oh, the black people have it bad. Oh, we're even worse. We have it even worse. And so I think that this is. I'm like. I just think, yeah, that we can get canceled really easy. I mean, Coco, you've been canceled so many times by a lot of white people um, here in Portland. Only I have. People. That's my feeling, so I don't want to put you on the spot. But no, it's true. It's only white It's people. true. I have been, not really, because I'm pretty, I'm more, I've been canceled more by the POC and black people here, but because I'm so vocal and have my receipts, I think. I don't know. I think that people are a little bit more intimidated by me. White people are more intimidated by me. But um, it's an issue here in Portland. Uh, the amount of the anti-blackness, the, the straight-up racism. Um, I mean, how many people marched for two years ago for George Floyd but are still working white events on Juneteenth? Even though it's Pride and everything like yeah. that. But they have, they have the option of turning down those events and giving it to black, not POC, black mm -hmm. people. Yeah, it's true. We actually had a really great dialogue about this earlier today, and I do want to touch on that in a second. Um, I think that also when it comes to you specifically, is you don't actually back down when people are uh, pushing you down. You're one of the few people, you and your drag mom, that when people start to really come after you or try to cancel you online, you don't actually just sit there. You don't let people silence you. And I think people really take issue with that because they want to put you in your place and you refuse to let them. I think that goes back into one of the questions you asked me of like the Beth issue was like the reason why I, t like, I don't take anything from anywhere is like I almost like I could have been dead. I could have been on the streets. So I'm like, no, your opinion, you don't know where I was. Yeah. And Ooh. you're you're Ooh. not the reason why I'm here. And so, you know, my hard work is why I'm here. I take myself mm -hmm. seriously because of where I was. So um, it's more along those lines. That's why I'm like, I don't, I, yeah, I can't take, I can't, and I, I don't mean to be ethnocentric and my worst stuff isn't worse than anyone else's worse, but I just absolutely have a problem when, um, when people try and hold those things against you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that actually might be the time. I loved, I've never heard that phrase before. My worst isn't any worse than anyone else's worse. That's a really... That's, that's, I learned that in college. That's the, the defini definition of ethnocentrism. I mean, that's why uh, religion, I have a problem with religion too, is because yeah. people that, you know, tr tribes that we have never been communicated with um, are going to hell because they haven't met Jesus or, mm -hmm. you know, or some white person. I don't know how they were white in, in Africa. Um, but you, so that that's sorry I, I don't know yeah. if you put that in there no <laughs> missionaries and colonization is a big problem and it's it's why we have the society that we have today and mm -hmm. it's something that we're still suffering from a lot of effects of yeah absolutely so the secondary piece to this is what would be something that you'd want the people who don't like you or try to cancel you or change a wikipedia page which is 
God dang, that was childish. Yeah. We'll explain that a little bit. Yeah. But what would you want to say to people who actively and blatantly misunderstand you? Um, if you spent as much time as I do on my, my art, then you too wouldn't be as insecure with it. Maybe? I don't know. Yeah, no. That's to my think, haters. You're asking me what I would say to yeah, my haters. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I'm. I would say that I. I think that I'm better than you, which, <laughs> and that. <laughs> um, but no, I haven't said it. I haven't said anyone, but that's how you, I have yeah. to think that I'm better than my haters. And Oof. you know, you're hating for a reason. You want to be. You want to be where I'm at. I, I don't know. Well, I, you also <laughs> mentioned earlier that your yeah. art was literally something that saved you. So. Yeah. Of course you take it seriously. Of course it's something that you feel that you are, have to be protective of, you know? And of course it's something that you would pride yourself on if it's something that dug you out of a hole and gave you the notoriety that you've had, like being on national ad, ad campaigns, like we said about the WoW Present stuff too. And just how you, like, you know, started paying entertainers in the city. You've made waves. Like you were a sweet Miss Sweetheart 29 of Portland. Like you did all of these things. You were also, yes, a Miss Gay Oregon too. Like you did a lot of really amazing things in a short amount of time doing drag. And I think that that's okay. You know, funny thing is, that's I, I want to actually just pause on that a little bit. I think that that's really interesting to say, I think we all want to say that about our haters. I would like to think that I'm better than them because I'm not doing that to them. Like that's also part of it. Like, like why can't, why do I have to consistently sit in a mode of where I'm rising above them when why can't I just consider that I might be better than I meant more talented <laughs> <laughs> I mean yeah, not, well, honestly like if you yeah. you have to break it down to yourself because when you know like when it, it gets lonely and it gets depressive when you're like why do these people that I look up to here in Portland like why do they hate me or why do they mm -hmm. seem so jealous and the only reason was either my personality or that they think that they want to be they want they wish that I had what I have or something like that. And so I, you have to tell yourself that, yeah, they, they, they want your art. They wish they were you. And, you know, unless we sat down, I don't know why they don't like me. A lot of them. I think, <laughs> I think it's exactly what you're saying. It's yeah. a lot of this whole like shadow self that we see. And a lot of the times it's things that we see in ourselves that we don't like. Absolutely. If we see it in other people, then we get extra uh, vicious about it because it's a attribute of ourselves that we don't like. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I mean, it comes down to self hatred in a lot of ways. And there so. is, and it's so, and this is also what I'm going to say about Flawless's personality, to me at least, is, and I have a great example of this because me and Flawless talked about this. I posted my pride schedule and it's heavy. Like there's like over 30 something gigs on it and whatever. I'm smiling and, right now while you say that. And, <laughs> and, and, I honestly take it a little bit like Flawless's personality. Like, I was afraid to post this thing, my confidence that I've succeeded, like Flawless succeeds in the things she does, like with her makeup and how she does drag, that you're afraid to also sometimes show it off to people because you're like, I worked really hard to be here. This has literally saved me in different capacities. And I know that immediately from you seeing it, you're going to feel a way about it negatively. Even though posting a schedule or just showing up looking as beautiful as you always do is not a threat to anyone else. Mm -hmm. First mm -hmm. of all, what we do is um, not selfish, but we do it for ourselves. We literally yeah. put on makeup to feel beautiful so we can mm -hmm. feel beautiful so I can say I am beautiful to myself. Yeah. We, we put that, we post up pictures online that how the, <laughs> the thing about online and Instagram is that anyone that like uses it is thinking about themselves, right? Yeah. They're talking about themselves. They're either they see what someone else posts, and then that makes that inspires them to post something because they want the same attention. So we all want attention. Yeah, we all want attention, yeah, especially all of us drag artists. And there's nothing there's nothing wrong with saying that you want attention. Yeah, right. Especially for the art we're putting out there. Of course, we want attention for mm -hmm. it. Like, yes, there is a lot of people who want to do drag in their room or whatever. But then why would they post those pictures online unless they wanted some sort of attention? And we spent most of our childhoods not being celebrated for being queer and being different. So why not in our adulthood? Can we, can't we get out there and, and want That's attention cute. for that? You know, so it sounds like we have more similarities than differences. Yeah. Yes. It yeah. Does. None of us it are does. more special than the others. Yeah. Unless you, unless you're hating and then I'm better than you. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, as we get to our last two topics here, as we're kind of getting close to our time, 
Um, the one thing I did want to mention is Flawless brought this up earlier, and it is kind of a timely topic because I think this episode will come out before then. But um, there has been drama online today, not involving Flawless, but drama online today specifically about whether or not, whether or not white drag artists should be participating at what level is either producing, hosting, or performing in shows that happens to be on Pride Weekend. Pride Weekend here in Portland is, uh, you know, it's a Father's Day weekend. Um, it's also Juneteenth. So we were kind of talking about this a little bit, about whether or not it's appropriate for white queer people, or actually non-black queer people, to participate in Pride Celebration shows or getting that showcase during Juneteenth. And um, I'm actually going to start with this a little bit. I have my own thoughts and opinions on it, of course. The thing is, we absolutely agree that Pride is for every queer person. Everybody should feel safe, welcome, get to watch, get to perform, get to participate as much as possible. And it's an exciting thing that it's actually happening on Juneteenth weekend because there is always that, you know, subset of queer people who are also black and queer who don't ever get to celebrate these both sides of their identity at the same exact time. And this is a beautiful time for them to do this. Now, do I believe that white entertainers should be completely stricken off the record during that Sunday day? Obviously not. However, leaving room for black entertainers to have that spotlight and that showcase to be able to be in the forefront in a queer space or queer stages or queer whatevers on those days, I think is absolutely okay too. Because there still is two other days, Friday and Saturday, that you know white queer or non-black queer people can also participate. And I'm not saying that for the shows that are out there right now, they're on the books and whatever, it should be canceled in place of black entertainers. No, we don't also, we also black people don't necessarily want to work on Pride Weekend or Juneteenth either. So that is something to be considered. I'm just saying that if people wanted to leave room for more black people to be showcased, especially the ones who are writing online saying, hi, you know, I don't have any Pride bookings, that might be a great opportunity for you to reach out and be like, hey, you know what? I have a gig on Saturday. I talked to the producer, would you like my gig on this day? No, it's not a pity gig, but I saw your post. Maybe you want to participate in that. So let's talk about that. Um, I feel like your first question, or one of your questions, there's a few in there. Um, <laughs> do I think that white people, or excuse me, non-black people, because this, this holiday is not POC, black holiday. Mm -hmm. um, do I think that non-black people should be able to perform? Um, I believe that it's their decision and not mine. Um, if a black producer booked you, that is, you can say no to the gig. Um, there's, there's a lot of privilege that white people have. They get more gigs than black people. If, you're, if you, you see that there's, black people are usually, um, there's always usually like one or two of us, but there's like four other white people. So you get booked more than us uh, 363 days of the year um, that's yeah that's kind of my my thing if you re if you're really about what you stand for you live in portland you're you're woke you're liberal you're progressive then that that's your decision i'm not going to make you feel bad if you want to perform on juneteenth um but if you are performing at a juneteenth show and you are white then i'm gonna make you feel bad yeah oh but if it's a absolutely. if it's a gay pride event then yeah, that's your decision my uh my, your insecurities are not my fault. Mm. Yeah, that's yeah. tea. That's yeah. tea. Um, thank you for that. So, as we were at our time... Ooh, can I also say one more thing with oh, that, yeah, too? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Because um, you mentioned a point about people, like, comparing gigs, too. I, I do drag for a living, as in I don't do anything else. I don't go to another place and spend hours there. Um, so, I, I really want people to... It's not a competition of numbers or whatever, but it, like when you post your gigs, it is a way for people to be able to see, see like what you have, where to be. There's a lot of gigs going. There is a lot of op whether you're performing in them or not. There is a lot of gigs happening, and people that do support us and come to our shows, they want to know where we're performing. So um, just make sure we're being respectful towards each other, and it's not a competition. Yeah. Um, and and if it is quality versus quantity, and and vice versa. Yeah. T. Um, so the last question that we always like to ask people is if you got into a bar fight here, if you got into a bar fight, what three Portland or Portland Jason, like Vancouver drag artists would you want on your team to help you win the bar fight and why? 
uh, you told me to plan for this earlier, and I... Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> they would definitely be... They would definitely be white. Um, <laughs> I... I would probably say... I'm not going to say, because I, I, well, I would say, I would say they would be white, and I'm not going to say who specifically, because I don't want them to feel bad or think that I, I'm calling them aggressive if they, when they listen to this podcast or anything like that. But the reason why I would pick them white, because they would, uh, when the pol police came, that even though I would be going to jail right away, because they just pick us up <laughs> right away, at least once I finally got bailed out of jail, that um, it would be like, they did something for the I don't know I just totally messed up that I tried to make it funny I tried to make it funny I don't know who I would pick I would probably uh, probably three members from the ISRC because those people are just absolutely evil ruthless beings <laughs> allegedly 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 <laughs> Oh, that Wikipedia page is going to get updated again oh my allegedly. gosh it is allegedly is under the table off the record um, you know what Great answer. <laughs> Great answer. I love that question because it's so interesting how people like have to work through it. Like in what they do with their drama, their cancer. It's funny, nobody's actually said anything negative. Like, so we've been, um, people have written us about our podcast for things that get mentioned, um, even as recently as last week. And so what's funny about it is nobody ever seems to have a problem with that question. Like, Shaniqua, actually, because she's the one who everybody always says, Shaniqua lives lives for the fact that everybody says her. Like, every time I get my hair braided by her, she's like, so who else said me? Right. Else said me? I, I've been, <laughs> I've been mentioned me? a few times, I think, too. You have been mentioned. Yeah. I think yeah. you have, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think you asked Jordan, too. And Jordan, and we've only met, like, three times, and he chose me. Yeah. Chose me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. a great question. Um, so, um, that does bring us to the end of our episode. What are things that you want to promote? Um for the kids. Also, uh, please give out all of your social media information for people. And people who are in the audience, give a round of applause for Flawless Shade. Yes! Yay! Give her a round of applause. Uh, I have lots of things that I want to promote. Um, this, every Saturday I host a, or not every Saturday, every first and third Saturday I host a show called Big Drag Energy. Um, it's at Rebel Rebel, and it's a, there's no cover, as in free, except for tipping. Please tip and buy drinks. Um, that's uh, going to be happening this Saturday. And then I have Flawless Sunsets every Tuesday in June at Revolution Hall. Big Hats Brunch uh, at Cur Curious Comedy Theater on the, four or on the 11th. On the 14th, I have Flawless Sunsets at Revolution Hall. On the 17th, I will be in California. I don't know why I shared that, but I feel like I'm going to go down this list and read it because I need it. Um, the 18th, I'm headlining Dollapalooza. It's an underground pride. It's called What's the Vibe with Majesty. Um, the 19th, I have, I'm performing at, or producing a brunch uh, called Pride Takeover at 10 Barrel and then headlining Pride Main Stage after that. They haven't done announcements yet, but it's Pride Month and I'm announcing it right now. Um, later on that evening, I'll be at Blackout Intersection uh, with uh, Monique Hart. After that, I'll be, um, this is still the 19th, by the way, Bella Palooza um, <laughs> for Dad featuring Willow Pill, the winner of RuPaul's Drag Race Season 14. The 21st is my birthday. I'll be uh, hosting Fall Sunsets at Revolution Hall, birthday celebration. And um, ending on the 28th of this month, Fall Sunsets at Revolution Hall. And there's a lot of private gigs under there. Nice. That's awesome. Flawless.shade on Instagram. And that's flawless as in no flaws, dot as in period, and shade as in bitch. <laughs> God, you are your mother's child. <laughs> well, you have a lot of opportunities to catch her. So yeah. I just want to say thank you again for sharing doing this with us and sharing everything. And Thank you so much. I love you. I love you both. So much. I know you probably hear me talk shit to this bitch all the all time, Donatella. <laughs> <laughs> when I'm allowed. <laughs> but yeah, it's really good to to hang out with you, you know, and not drink. It, that's kind of yeah. different and weird. But it's very normal, different. And, but I, and I love it. And I yeah. can do it, too. So <laughs> Yeah. Well, I absolutely adore and love you, too. And it's it's just so great that we got to have you here. 
Also, I want to say um, vote. And I, I, it's important that we vote. I know the Democrats haven't done anything for the black people at all or anything for probably us queer folks. But it's so important that we vote and for this midterm. So make sure you're registered. All of it. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Please vote progressive. Vote. Progressive. <laughs> Always. Uh, definitely not Democratic or Republican. Since yeah. we haven't burned down the system yet, it's still important that we vote because that's how we can get a change out there before we burn that system down and build something that will actually make a difference. Yeah. So, <laughs> listen to two episodes ago. Um, thank you, everybody, for participating in this today. Thank you, Flawless, for being on. You are wonderful. I love you dearly. We talk literally every day. So, <laughs> we'll um, talk to you after this. Yeah. So, Flawless, say bye to the kids. Talk to for now. <laughs> Bye. Bye. This has been another episode of A Gem of a Secret Podcast. The hosts of A Gem of a Secret Podcast are Donna and Coco Gem Holiday. You can follow Donna at Donatella underscore my secrets on Instagram. You may follow Coco Gem Holiday at Coco Gem Holiday on Instagram. Original music by Touche Douche and Party Favors. You can follow them respectively at Touche Likes Beef and Party Favors Music on Instagram. For more content, follow them online at www.ajemofasecretpodcast.com. That is www.ajemofasecretpodcast.com.